Cholton's Sean Rogers in today. Thank you for coming in. Mary Earps, obviously with winning the award. Yeah. Um, and obviously her story's amazing. I ain't gonna lie, I watched the Ben Foster one for Wrexham. Do you reckon that uh, girls football is becoming a lot more popular now, obviously with the success of England? And I saw on Twitter, obviously the amount of tickets that's been sold for England's game. I had like Karen Carney, Laura Bassett there, and I was like thinking, Oh my god, I've just like these like play for England, you know. Getting in the car after like, Mum, I have to one of Karen Carney's shots <laughs> today. And who was the Irish number one I at the time? Not. Honestly, learnt so much from her in my time yep. there. Sorry, Van Valendal, who ended up being the Dutch number one. Another person that I learnt a lot lot off at Arsenal was Farrah Williams when she came. Then you moved to Aston Villa. Yeah. How did this come about? In the COVID time, obviously, it was halfway through our season. That's your one of your highest moments. I want to talk about another moment where you got red carded. Because this doesn't happen yeah. a lot for goalkeepers. At St George's Park, it was quite a long walk, so I had such a long time to be thinking, like, what kind of captain am I going to be today? What a save from Mark Howard. Being a professional goalkeeper, I definitely understand the importance of recovery for the next performance. I've finally found the perfect product to help me recover. Introducing the Mito Mobile Flex from Mito Red Light. Their industry leading devices harness the power of red light therapy, emitting red low light wavelengths through the skin. This safe and effective process kickstarts natural tissue recovery and a huge range of added benefits. Whether I'm at home relaxing or whether I'm in the studio researching goalie or no goalie, Mito Mobile Flex is designed to help me recover at my ultimate convenience. Its portability is unmatched and it even comes in its own handy travel case. You can effortlessly slip it into your suitcase or your kit bag. That's what makes it so travel friendly. The Mobile Flex offers freedom and flexibility, saving you the need to find a plug with up to three hours use on one single charge. That's enough charge to get me through two 90 minute matches to help my recovery. It's an on the go solution that gives you no excuses but to aid your recovery. My favorite feature about the Mobile Flex unit is its spot treatment capabilities. Whether it's a sore knee, hand, foot or ankle after any intense matches, the device delivers targeted and immediate red light therapy exactly where you need it. The Mito Mobile Flex unit helps keep me in top form and you can trust in it too. Hit the link in the description below for your 10% saving using code FLEX10 from the Yours Mine Away podcast. Now that's a great save by Mark Howard. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Today I'm uh, really delighted to be joined by another woman footballer. Uh, I've got Cholton's Sean Rogers in today. Thank you for coming in. No, thank you for having me. Uh, obviously you're in the championship at the moment with Cholton. Uh, the season's uh, only six games, seven games in. Uh, how's it been going so far since pre-season? Uh, it, it's been a tough start for us, um, a bit slow to start with, and then we've gradually picked up points and we're in a really good place uh, now um, just to kick on and try and pick up as many points as we can moving forward. Yeah, uh, you like I said uh, before, you recently just joined them after a loan move last year where you played a lot of games. Clearly enjoyed your time uh, and wanted to make it permanent, so must have been delighted to get that over the line. Yeah, um, I've spoke previously about obviously last year at Charlton. Um, it was massive for me to like come in the history that the club has, especially in the women's game. But uh, when I spoke to Karen, the manager, um, she was really delighted, obviously, with how I played last season. And obviously, I think that kind of helped sway me to make the move permanent. Um, obviously, I'd come back off the season previously, not playing much football. So then to come in on loan and play as many games as I did, I was very grateful for that, the, the trust that they put in me. So... I think it just made my my decision a lot easier to come to come down here. What about moving to London then? <laughs> it, I do I do miss the Midlands. I, I must say, as I said, the clues in the name being the middle of yeah. everything. I can get a train to London. I can get a train up to Manchester or Liverpool. But it's 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 different. Like I do like it. There's there's always something you can do in London. Can always find something different to do. So yeah. Are, are you and your teammates all quite close as well? Yeah, I, we've got. Uh, a group of us that are, we're just like just always doing stuff with each other whereas like could be like going for like food um we're planning to go like um pumpkin picking soon for, for <laughs> nice. halloween so yeah we try and do stuff together as a group so yeah well, that that helps in the dressing room though when you all socialize together and you've all got that like not many of you will be from london will you no we've got um quite a few of us obviously from the midlands uh there's a couple up, um 
a couple up north as well. But there is an, actually a few girls that are still like London based. So w- when they say, oh, it's an hour away, I'm like thinking, my home's like three hours away. So it's a bit different. I do I do miss home, but it's good to have like a good group and then it just makes being down here so much easier. Yeah. And uh, when you signed again, then did you have to do any initiations? <sighs> I it's got, horrible, I got, it? I got out of this. <laughs> I don't know how. I think it was just because last year, obviously, I was on on loan. So I don't know how I got away with it. But I think when I did mine at, uh, at Villa a few years ago, it was on the, the bus um, back from an away trip. So Horrible. Yeah. How did it go down? It was me and this other, other girl um, doing it. I can't even remember what we sang, but it was just one of them. You just had to go. You just got to go with it. Otherwise... It's just a lonely place. The room seems to get smaller and smaller. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a terrible singer. So all my songs that I've ever done are like comedy ones. They're either like a Disney song or the song from The Hangover that Ed sings while playing the piano. I'll do something really stupid. I think as well, like, the worst part about it is, like, you go in for it, but you can see people's eyes, like, like I think goalkeepers actually think that they can sing, though. No, definitely not this case. I think, oh, I think no, like I actually genuinely think goalkeepers think they can sing, but then because they just go for it and they don't really care. But inside you're a bit like like your hands like shaking like uh, this. The thing that I don't get about initiations is no one enjoys them. You don't enjoy like when you listen to other people doing them. I hate them. Like yeah, the dressing room don't enjoy them. It's just more about how that person feels at that time and you make them crumble. Yeah, I think as well. Like sometimes you know when the person's getting up you kind of have to like help them through it by like even like clapping to the song and then it kind of gets them going yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. But you just, you're just hoping that that, even if it's like 30 seconds, it just goes like that. Right, okay. Well, I've got some quick fire questions for you uh, just to get to know you. Right, catch or parry? Catch. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Play short or kick it long? I, pl- uh, you like I, wanna, I, from the back, I, you? I do like playing out from the back, but when I see... See, on to play, I do like to play a long ball. Yeah, nice. Uh, who's your favourite ever goalkeeper? Buffon. Yeah, Gigi. Yeah. So what a legend. He's just like a Rolls Royce. Yeah, he is, yeah. He's just like a, a good bottle of red. He's just getting better and better. I just I just can't like believe like he's, he's journeying, like the age he's playing up to. And he's like, he's just so cons- like consistent. You never really see him like doing anything fancy he just makes things look easy yeah he's very uh laid back and he's unflappable as a, a person oh, yeah. he's one of my favorites ever uh i'd have loved to have seen him in the prem at one point but weren't Definitely. meant to be uh right uh best goalkeeper in the world right now you can do male and female this would be a good one i think female at the moment you have to say mary Earps. obviously with winning the award yeah um and obviously her story is amazing of where obviously she came from in the sense of where she thought her england career had kind of like finished and then like things change and suddenly obviously now she's obviously won a European championship and got to the final of a, a World Cup. Um, but in the men's game, it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to say now because every goalkeeper is a bit different and better than the other one in a certain way. Yep. But for for me personally, I actually like, um, I'd probably say Edison or Alisson. Yep. Just, I always say one of the Brazilians. Yeah, it's hard to choose, it, isn't it? It, it? it is hard to choose because they're so they're so similar, but then one of them's better than the other in certain areas. So I'd probably say out out of those two, they're very very good goalkeepers. Yep, fair enough. I don't blame you for sitting on the fence with that <laughs> one either, right? Um, starter or dessert? Starter. Yeah. See, <laughs> I d- I like sweet stuff, but it's mainly like actual sweets yeah, and like yeah, chocolate. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I get. I go to a restaurant and I look at the dessert menu and I actually think, I don't want cheesecake, I don't want this, I don't want that. I might as well have just had a start. I know. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame you for that one. Right, long sleeve shirt or short sleeve shirt? Short sleeve. Do you wear underarm underneath as well or are you just short sleeve? Just short sleeve. Nice. It, has, it has to be like really cold or for me not to be well to, to wear a skin. Yep. Uh, how tall are you? Do you want it in feet or? Yeah, go in feet, that's it. I'd say I'm about... I want to say about five nine. Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, I wouldn't say anything taller. You're quite t- like tall for a female goal for a woman goalkeeper, aren't you? Compared to some of the other ones, I'd say I'm about probably average. average. Like you have this in women's game where you have like the average height, and then you get the anomaly of someone that's very tall. Jill Scott. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. If she was a keeper, great. Oh, like, do you know that. what I mean? Right, and then uh, final one, right? Uh, last minute penalty save or last minute score a goal? I think they're likely I'd go for the last minute penalty save. Would you, yeah? Because I ain't, ain't going to lie, I watched the Ben Foster one for Wrexham and I was just she like waiting and as soon as he saved I was like, can you imagine the thrill? Like obviously Incredible, scoring a goal yeah. is like one in like a million for a goalkeeper but that is actually what you paid to do. Yep. You'll and be that, remembered forever for yeah. one of those moments. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was it was class. So like I'd, I'd be like, love to be in that position. Yeah, fair enough. Right, uh, let's kick this off with our usual questions. Right, how did you get into goalkeeping? So I got into goalkeeping actually watching my dad be a goalkeeper from like a really like young age. Um, I'd always go to him. He, he'd play Saturdays and Sundays, and I'd just be like with him, like obviously tagging along. What level did he play? At? Um, it wasn't like a really high like high level, but I know for, for a fact when he was younger. He, he got scouted like by Wolves and West Brom and stuff like that, but he just he just never really chose to kind of run with it. He just loved yeah. playing. That's nice that you looked up to him though enough yeah. to then but start it, taking it, it on yourself. It wasn't the thing to be a goalkeeper at the time for me. It was more a case like I really enjoy this. Like and at the time, obviously, not many girls were playing football, and I was like, why is this like? And then it was literally just me and my cousin was the only two girls at school playing football with the boys. Yep. So was you joining in with the boys? Yeah. School yeah, teams yeah. Then? yeah. I remember just like they'd, they'd even chuck you in goal, and like obviously you do that, and then obviously you come out and you do a bit, but they'd always want to put you in goal. So I'm just assuming that's probably why as well. And I remember actually being in goal was we actually got asked in our team who would want to go in goal and literally no one put their hand up and I was like thinking if I do it now I'd, I can say I've done it and then I can say well it's your turn next yep. and that I, I literally had like a like a really like good game and I was like oh I guess I'll stay in then yeah and realize you don't have to do as much running yeah yeah did, was it that moment then that you realized yeah I could do this I, that, I, I'm a goalie I think so yeah I think just it's it sounds so silly when you explain it to people but the moment when you actually fling yourself through the air and like you save something where you actually don't think you're gonna save and you feel it touch your hand and go around the post, he's like, like you actually think to yourself, "Wow, that's that's quite sick." Yeah, yeah. I always used to when I was a kid like the moments when you got the ball in the face or somewhere that hurt, <sighs> right? And everybody wants you to react like you're hurt, but as a goalie, your natural yeah, reaction yeah. is just to get up and like you don't rub it. It's that we've always had that saying in football: "Don't rub it." It no, doesn't hurt if you don't rub it. I think as well, like when, especially when you get winded. People are asking if you're okay, and you literally you you can't respond because you're like, like breathing in. But you, you just give the thumbs the thumbs up to say yeah yeah I'm good. And then when everyone turns away, you're a bit like okay that really hurt. Uh, after that uh, school match, then going home and telling your your dad that you wanted to be a goalkeeper, he must have been full of pride, or was he a bit anxious about it? <laughs> no, he was he was fine with it. Um, obviously, being a goalkeeper, he like kind of understood like. The, the good and the bad moments but I think he was just happy that I wanted to do something that was a bit different obviously one not many girls wanted to play football and two not many actual young children want to be a goalkeeper so to actually be one of those people to actually carry that on I think he thought was kind of kind of cool and uh obviously being a girl coming through like with a boys thing was it was the opportunities very limited or was it that there wouldn't have been as many girls teams back then either? I was quite fortunate in terms of obviously I used to play football with the boys at school but it was actually a teacher at school that noticed me and my cousin just playing the only girls playing with the boys and she said there's a girls team starting up locally would you two be interested and I was like I told my parents and then it was literally just like only a couple of us and we actually played in a boys' league. So yep. an all-girls team playing in a boys' no league. No way, that's incredible. Yeah, so don't get me wrong, the first year we would get popped and yep. stuff like that. But then you actually start earning the respect of the boys when you're, like, when you're the one knocking them over and yep. beating them, scoring past them or tackling them. You kind of earn the respect that way. So I kind of like... That's a bit different to some people probably my age where they had to play in a boys team. I was quite fortunate yep. that a girls team formed at the right time for me. Was that level of competition then would have made you all develop? Uh, and you probably turned into a really good team by the end of it. And especially when you would have competed against other girls team, you'd have noticed the difference. Yeah, definitely. So 
I think as well when we used to play in like five like five aside tournament tournaments, there'd be one every every summer. So we'd be playing against boys teams in that as well. And it was like no one expects you to beat them. So when you do, you've got the parents on the side moaning, you've got the parents on the side saying to you, saying, You've just got beat by a girl. Yeah. Like like sort it out. Does that hurt? It did, but then I found it quite funny, like at the end of the day you have been beaten by a girl. Yeah. There's just two ways, obviously, you could have yeah. taken that. You could have took it as motivation or you could have took it as like, oh, as a bit of slander against the girls. Yeah, but yeah. Like, uh, you clearly seem like the person that would have went, yes, we beat them. Yeah. And that's it. And you just could have cracked on with I th- it. I always think, obviously, in football, you play because you enjoy it, but you play to win. Oh, of so course. when you beat someone, you beat someone. So. Do you reckon that uh, girls football is becoming a lot more popular now, obviously, with the success of England and stuff? Do you think that you've, have you noticed a boost in the game? Definitely, I think. The other day I saw on Twitter, obviously, the amount of tickets that's been sold for England's game at Wembley versus the Netherlands coming up soon. And I always think to myself, like, when I was younger, I never really thought, like, women's football could get to that kind of point in terms of, especially at, when I was younger, my age, like, I used to go to women's games and you'd be lucky if there was probably five, 6,000 there. Yeah. So to see that now where you've got, like, I saw like 55,000 tickets have been sold. It's incredible. So it is amazing. It is. And I think, obviously, there's, there's still such a long way to go to grow the game domestically. But it's got to start somewhere. And obviously, the more people we can get actually just wanting to come to games. I always understand in women's football, like, not everyone's going to like it. Um, but it's just finding a way for people just to tolerate and just accept that the girls want to play too. Yep. And... Just giving girls the opportunity to decide whether they actually want to play or not. Because if you don't give someone the option and you just tell them, they'll never think it was a possibility. Yeah, whereas, that's a great point. No. Whereas like, if you can say to a girl at school, OK, this week we're doing football and then next week we'll do netball. The girl might have that football session. Think, you know what? I really enjoyed that. OK, goes home, tells mum and dad, I really enjoyed that at school. Can we try something a bit more local? Yeah. And there's opportunities where girls can do that now whereas when I was younger you 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 never did football in lessons yeah it was always like the free time that you got like at, at lunch time or at yeah. break times even like back then then oh, I remember when I was in school it was almost very stereotypical that the boys did football outside and the girls did netball uh, I, it has there been a switch <sighs> see I'd be interested to see this now in schools um I do notice when I go into schools to do player appearances that obviously there is girls' football teams, which is really nice to see. But obviously, I, I've got a young a young niece. Um, she's only four. Um, so it'd be interesting to see in the next couple of years what that looks like for her at school, just having that probably opportunity to discover whether she actually likes football or not. Because I can influence it a certain degree to yep. say, obviously, it's really good, do it. Yeah. Um, but then it's actually for her to actually go and do it and experience that and obviously being in a group of people because I think especially football gives you so many social skills. It really does, yeah, I agree. And I think it can really op- open you up as a person and you f- you actually find people in football. I think you really find proper friends in football. Like, not everyone's going to be your best friend in football, I understand that, but, like, some people, they'll be... The memories that you have playing football with them, you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. And some of the experiences that you have. Yep. Well, I, I, I totally agree. Like, uh, speaking from my own experience, I've been in football for uh, 20 years now. And every year I'm put in a new dressing room or uh, every couple of years with 30 players. And you get on with everybody. It's actually incredible how you can uh, uh, adapt to every situation. And then you'll find two of them are your best friends. And then like you'll, they'll stay with your friends forever. Uh, football does create those situations where... You, you feel uncomfortable at times, you feel confident at times. It can be the, the best and the worst game in the world. Obviously, you find it no different. I think, especially, like, you get on with the people. I understand, like, in any walk of life, you, you're not going to be best friends with everybody, but you learn to find a common ground with them where you've got the same goal, but you just have different opinions on how you get there, but you still work together to achieve that goal. And I find in football that you actually find a way of dealing with that a lot better than you probably would on the outside. Yep. Uh, fair enough. Right. I want to get on to how you got scouted then. From a, a very early age, you were scouted by Wolves originally. But So was you still playing in that girls' team? And then yeah. Got... 
So it's f- funnily enough, um, the two the people that scouted me that worked at Wolf, they always have an argument when I've when I've ever like gone to see them. Obviously, whenever I've like just happened to bump into them, they, they always both have, want to take the credit, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they do actually. Like oh, I scouted her. No, no, you didn't. I scouted her. But it was literally just playing a game at, th- um, at the time. I don't know. I, I probably can't even remember who it was against, but. They just came over towards the end to, to my dad, who was actually the coach as well at the time. Um, and me and a couple of girls got asked, obviously, we're interested in these two players. We've got trials. Um, would they be interested in coming? Obviously, as a kid, I'm a, a massive Wolves fan. So when I found out, I was like, yes, definitely. And my mum and dad were like, okay, we'll go. That drive home must have been amazing. Yeah, it was. Like, covered in, like, mud. You're there thinking... On Tuesday, I've got trials. That's lovely, that. Um, but I'm, I actually remember my first trial. I didn't get put in goal. They hadn't realised that I was actually a goalkeeper. Right, so obviously, okay. when the scout writes it, they just put the names of the people that's coming. Yep. So obviously, when I've gone, I've not gone in goal all session until we play the games at the end. Yep. And when I've gone in goal, they've come off and went, are you a goalkeeper? And I was like, yeah, that's what I've come for. And there was like... Okay, so the next time, obviously, I was with the goalkeepers doing the session. But did did you find just when you went with the goalkeepers, the improvement and the enjoyment level just went through the roof? Yeah, I think as well, like, I realised that a lot of the stuff that my dad had taught me was what they was doing anyway. The basics. Yeah, it's always yeah. the basics in goalkeeping. Yeah, 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 definitely. And honestly, those years at Wolves was like some of the best years of my life as a kid. Yeah. Honestly, it... it, it, it you can ask my parents if you ever get a chance to meet them. It actually broke my heart leaving. Oh, did it really? Yeah, yeah honestly. You didn't leave for a bad club though, no, did you? No, well, another Midlands club. Obviously, I went to went to Birmingham. Yeah. But it was hard at the time because back then, girls were called Centre of Excellences, run by the FA. Yes. So you had to apply to be one of these. Yep. And at the time, it was going through a re-registration and Wolves lost theirs. West Brom gained it. Right, okay. And obviously, I went to my mum. I'm like, I'm not going to West Brom. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going there. And then I ended up, um, someone at Birmingham contacted my parents, obviously, because they'd saw me play against Birmingham yep. when we'd play. And I don't think I had to do a trial for, for them. I literally just turned up near the end of the trial phase where they do, like, obviously the matches and stuff like that to play in them. You'd have been still very young then. Yeah, so I, I was at Wolves from under 10s till under 14s. Yep. Um, and then, obviously, I went to Birmingham after that season. Yep. So I'd have been, like, 15, yeah. 14, 15. Did you enjoy your time at Birmingham? I did, actually. The The club did a lot, a lot for me as well. Um, at a young age, like, I was, like, 15 going to try with the women's first team. Yeah, see, that's an incredible experience at such a young age. And I was playing with, like, um, in training, I had, like, Karen Carney, Laura Bassett there, and I was, like, thinking, oh, my God, I've just, like, these like play for England, you know? Yeah. Especially the Karen Carney one, because, obviously, when I was younger, obviously seeing the England players, like, Karen Carney was, like, up there, like, yeah. and having her, like, score past me in training, I was, like, thinking, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> But did you then, did, that must have been also motivating because you've been yeah, given an yeah. opportunity like that and you're like, I'm not that far away. If I keep working yeah, hard and yeah. if, I, if I keep doing well, I'm going to get more opportunities like this. Yeah, definitely. I think f- for me, like, I've got such a buzz, like, going into training with them because I, there's no real pressure on me. Yep. So literally, I can fling myself around and I'm, like, getting in the car after, like, Mum, I have to want a Karen Carney shot today. <laughs> Like, just, like, bigging yourself up a little bit because there's actually a reason that they've put you with them. What, what were they like to work with? So, like, so good in terms of... I didn't feel out of place in the sense of... I felt like I was just a young person coming up. Yep. But then they still treated me like a first-team player. So, like, if I made a mistake, they'd let me know. Yep. And I, I, I appreciated that. It let me to grow up pretty quickly um, and mature mature quite uh, quickly as well and then uh, the move to Arsenal as well then so yeah this this like came about like f- I'd been at Birmingham four years um I really enjoyed really enjoyed my time there um and I was away on international I think with the the 19s at the time and the there was a technical person technical director I think actually no he might have been the general manager um at Arsenal I think, he's, was it John, I think his name was John Bayer. He knew who I was, obviously, 
being at Birmingham playing against Arsenal. Um, I had actually quite a few good games against Arsenal as well. And he actually spoke to, he saw me speaking to my mum and I obviously approached my mum after. And I was like thinking, well, it's near the end of the season and there was getting, like, there was actually quite interested. Yep. Um, and I remember the, we had a cup game against Arsenal. We lost 2 1, but the men, uh, the, the women's first team coach was actually there watching the game. Um, watching. Right watching, place, right time. Yeah, no, watching me. Oh, no way. That's um, amazing. They actually sent him down to watch it. Luckily enough, had a good game, right place, right time, like you said. Um, and then it was a case of we had to drive down um, to meet them and obviously have the chats about how logistically it works. Obviously, at the time, like I'm going into obviously college and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like the guy, the guys at Birmingham was good in the sense in they understood. They didn't want me to leave, but they understood. Like when Arsenal comes, you can't really say no. Like it's an opportunity I really couldn't pass away, like getting to go and train with like Kelly Smith, Alex Scott. Some of the internationals that I had was amazing. Like I speak highly of um, Emma Byrne, who was the Irish number one I at the time. Emma. Honestly, learned so much from her in my time yep. there. I used to train with Emma a long, long time ago yeah. when Emma was at Arsenal. Yeah. Honestly, like just made things look easy, yep. but such a presence of a so person. Good. Yeah. Um, and then at the time, the other goalkeeper they just brought in was Sari van Valendal, who ended up being the Dutch number one, yep. literally months later. So I'm getting to train with the Irish number one and the, the Dutch number one. Learned so much. Honestly, I, it was like invaluable for me. Like yep. These people. Um, another person that I learned a lot, lot off at Arsenal was Farrah Williams when she came. Honestly, one of the best people technically I've ever seen in terms of can play with both feet. Yeah. And she used to like big me up in sessions. Like she's like, hit that ball. You can do it. Just hit it. And like I do it. She's like, see, I told you, you could do it. And just being like your parents at football and like pushing you through sessions and like telling you when it's not good enough or when you've had a really good session was yeah. was amazing. Did you take things off the goalkeepers, especially that you worked with? Like, would you look at Emma and go like her presence or? And then would you look at, uh, would you like take certain aspects of the game and try and implement in, into your game until you found your own style? I think for me, it's like, it was looking at what they did, but how it was effective and how I could tweak what they did based off me because Emma and Sari were very tall goalkeepers. I'm not the tallest of goalkeepers, so their position, say, on their line could be like afford to be like four, three, four yards higher. Yep. Whereas I probably need to be like only two. But be faster across your goal. Yeah. Yep. So it was just working that. And then obviously when you get into like blocking shapes, because their their limbs are longer, they can probably wait a split second longer to get into that position. Whereas I probably need to snap into it a lot quicker yes. to cover more of the goal. Yeah, I was talking to uh, one of our young goalkeepers at Wrexham about this yesterday. It's the same thing. He's a very small goalkeeper. And uh, he was saying that he wants to play higher. And I was like, it's the absolute opposite. Everyone thinks that small goalkeepers should play higher. It's the opposite. You need to play deeper, like a yeah. Hugo Lloris, like Shea Given did. Yeah. Like the, the, uh, it was easy for me to say, obviously, for the male footballers, because yeah. it's, it's more relevant to him. Yeah. But I was saying that those keepers are so fast across their line. Yeah. But where the bigger goalkeepers, the Fraser Fosters, the Nick Popes, they can afford to play higher because their limbs are longer and they'll make more blocks. Yeah. They don't need the reaction time to be like instant. Yeah, I think as well, if you look back at Larice when he first came to Spurs, his positioning was actually quite high. It was, yeah. And you could see that, obviously in the Prem, the, the, the ball flies so much quicker. Obviously, you're getting used to that when you see it, obviously, on TV. So he's probably thought, you know what, I can't get away with being this far off my line. Then yeah. if you actually watch him later on, you see him go retreat further back. But and then use his feet to a remarkable yeah, yeah. speed. That's what I mean. So... It was finding stuff that they did, but making it work for me. Yeah. And I think that's so important for goalkeepers. Like everyone has such a different style. But the main thing is you just need to be effective. That's it. Yeah, you, I, I always say that you, you should study someone that you really like watching and that is a similar body type to you. Yeah. Because you, you'll be able to gain the most attributes to someone that's more relevant to your body type. Yeah. So like f for me, I always looked up to Edwin van der Sar. I always thought that like, he was six foot three, same height as me. Uh, he he liked to play with both feet and he was very calm. I'm, yeah. I'm very calm in nature. So 
I, I used to go on YouTube and just watch clips and clips yeah. of like that because that's who I idolised. I would always try and mimic that type of a goalie. I think for me, like obviously, I said before, like Buffon was one of my favourite goalkeepers, but like a more modern one now is Jan Sommer. Yeah. See, like he's a very sim. He's not the tallest of yeah. goalkeepers, but he's so effective in how he uses. His he manipulates saves incredibly, doesn't that's he? That's what I mean, and the way he's able to be quite proactive in understanding where people are positioned to how he then can adjust his body to then make yeah. a save. Yeah, nice, good shout, right. Uh, then you moved to Aston Villa. Yeah. Uh, how did this come about then? So I'd been at Arsenal two years and I'd, I'd been brought in, trained a lot with the first team. I'd obviously played a lot of games with the reserves and I was like 19, coming 20. And I was thinking, you know what? Reserve football's done so much for me, but I kind of need to be chucked into the the senior game and learn and make mistakes. And obviously, I wasn't really going to get that at Arsenal. So I literally had to be like, okay, as much as I want to stay, and I've learned a lot, I literally need to just go and sink or swim, basically. Yep. So it came about that um, at, there was an opportunity at Villa. We got in contact with the manager at the time. And uh, he was really keen to get me on board. Like, he knew my progression, uh, obviously seeing me play as well. Um, and it was just a case of obviously just going there and actually, like, talking to them and figure out what their plan was and stuff like that. And then I remember that se that first season, I made a lot of mistakes. Like, I made a few mistakes first in and I ended up getting dropped. Was this the first time you'd gone full-time? No, this was still part-time. Part part time at Villa, um, training twice a week, yep. um, seven till nine. Um, but yeah, I'd made a few mistakes that had cost us like, obviously goals. I'm thinking, what am I doing wrong here? And I remember getting dropped. This is when you found out when you got to the game, whether you was playing or not, and he pulled me to the side and he said, I'm dropping you for this game and so and so is gonna play. And I was just like, I was like really like deflated, but I remember it was in a cup game and it had gone to penalties. And because I'd saved a penalty in the game before, they decided to put me in for the penalties. I think I saved four penalties, no way. three or four penalties, and then we, we won the game and then applied the next game. But for me, that season was such a learning curve of, right, I could get away with this in reserve football. I really can't get away with this now. Yep. And then over the years, I kind of, progressed to the point where I knew what I could get away with and things that I was making mistakes with before I wasn't doing then later. Yep. So each year at Villa was kind of like a progression. Yep. So we finished near the bottom, mid-table, and then obviously a couple of seasons later we actually got promoted, which was a very weird season, obviously, because it was yeah. during COVID times. And you got the Golden Glove that year as well. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I didn't even think... I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I'm going to mention it. I love the <laughs> clean sheets, come on. I didn't Honestly, I didn't even think it was a thing. No, nah. I didn't. I didn't even think about it because obviously during the COVID time, obviously it was halfway through our season. So obviously it got to just after Christmas. It was when COVID was getting rumored. Okay, the league suspended. So for months we were like training. It could restart. Could restart. We was waiting then to find out if we got promoted. And I remember we got promoted. It was a weird celebration, obviously, because you couldn't go out. So yeah. like we was on Zoom to each other. And when we found out... Such like, a letdown, that, isn't it? Yeah. But I remember actually finding out we got promoted. My mum and dad was at home. And my boyfriend, obviously, was living with us at the time. And uh, I've gone in the room. I've shut the door. And then they just hear me scream. I'm like, we've done it. We've done it. We've got promoted. We've got promoted. And they've come bursting through the door. It was honestly, that moment will live with me. I actually, like, cried. Yeah. But it was just sad because like we actually couldn't really enjoy it. Yep. So then I remember coming back in the following year to pre-season. Obviously some of the girls had obviously gone and obviously some of the girls had stayed. And I just remember getting a phone call on my way to training and it was a general manager. Sean, I've got some really good news for you. And I was like, what, 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 why, what's happening? And she went, you've won the Golden Glove. I went, what? Say that again? She's like, I've won the, you've won the Golden Glove. I was like, are you serious? She was like, yeah, the trophy's come today, oh, obviously. Nice. So, like, I remember ringing my mum. I was like, mum, guess what? Guess what? And obviously, that for me, personally, was... It was never something I actually set out to do that season. The main goal for me was to get the club promoted. 
So then that just topped it off for me. And it was nice that the comments that I got from my teammates like to actually say that I really deserved it. Nice. Well, uh, that's your, one of your highest moments. I want to talk about another moment where you got red carded. Because oh, this doesn't happen yeah. a lot for goalkeepers. And touch wood, I've never been red carded. So I don't know this emotion. But talking to the outfielders in my team about when they get sent off, I want to hear your, your version of this. No, it was my fault, honestly. To be fair, I'm quite lucky because I'd got into like a scuffle in the first half and I got yellow carded. Right, okay, yeah. So then second half, luckily, as when the ball came over, I didn't want to come for it, but then someone shouted, Sean, and then I, I've just switched and then gone for the ball. And I think I'm... I'm coming, I'm like, I'm never going to get this. And I don't know why, I just jumped. And obviously my hands are like semi away from my body. And it's hit the hand, the, like, my, like yeah. my arm here. And I'm thinking, I'm literally thinking, no, no. Yeah. And I was like, oh. And then I could see her coming over. And I was like, it hit me here. I was like, it hit me here, it hit me here. And she's like, no, it hasn't. I was oh, just no. like, and I'm trying to delay as long as possible. Obviously, so we can get someone on, obviously, to come in. I just remember, like, just seeing the card go up and I just felt the whole room, like, coming, like, the whole stadium, like, coming on yeah. me. But the girls was fine with me after, like, they know it's not really in my nature to get sent. What's a walk like back to the dressing room? Um, It's a long walk. Yeah, I can imagine it is. Because, obviously, as well, like, I obviously took my shirt off, gave it to the per like, because one of the outfielders had to go and guard at the time. And give them my gloves. And I remember walking in thinking, what have I done? And then I remember the assistant came over. She patted me on the back. She's like, just don't worry about it. And then the opposition's goalkeeper coach actually came over to me and says, he's like, it's it's fine. Like, you, obviously, you haven't mean, meant to do it. So don't worry about it. Like, it yeah. happens. But I remember, because you can't, you have to stay in the changing room. Yeah, you're not allowed out. Yeah. You have so to the, sit there on your own. Yeah. So the general manager came down from the stands and came and sat with me and actually put put it on her phone for me to watch. And I was just like, John, just really deflated. I just wanted to get out of that building as quickly as possible. Yeah. But as soon as the whistle blowed, obviously put my tracksuit, I had a shower, put my tracksuit back on. Whistles were gone. And I've gone and stood with the girls, obviously, just to, and actually put like a message out on Twitter about it, like saying, just apologising to like the fans and yeah. my teammates and stuff like that. And everyone was just fine with it. I, I think I only missed like obviously one game, obviously, because of what the red card was for. Yeah. But I'd have been more worried about my gloves, you know, lending them to somebody else. I changed them after that. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> Honestly, I changed them after that. I was like, they can go in the bin. Yeah, yeah. One for superstition because you got sent off. Yeah. In them. But also someone else wearing your gloves, you're like, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Like, Joe, they're my tools. Joe, if someone asks me in training, can I borrow these? Just to that, go and go. I went, no, no, yeah. you can't. Yeah. No, you can't wear them. Yeah, goalies are strange. Uh, one final thing before I move on about like your, your career so far is uh, we talked off air slightly about how difficult it was trying to juggle college, training, uh, travelling. How how did you find all this and how hard was it? I have to take, obviously, it into consideration at the time. Obviously, I didn't drive during this time at Arsenal. Um, so I was quite fortunate that my mum, honestly, absolute saint of a person... She used to work down in London a couple of times a week in uh, Woking. Um, so That's she'd commute for her as well. Yeah, so she'd draw, some, like, drive down, obviously go to work, and obviously sometimes I'd get the train um, and then get a taxi from the train station to the training ground, obviously. It's in Watford, Arsenal's training ground, literally right next door to Watford. It's a bit weird, literally right next door to it. Um, and obviously I'd be there from like early in the morning till late afternoon, Sometimes I'd do like double sessions. So I'd be like um, in with the women from, I think it was half 10 till like two. And then with the reserves, I think it was like half five or five till seven. It's a long wait around, a long day. Yeah. So I was doing like double, double triple sessions there. And then obviously then she'd drive around and obviously I'd still have to wait for her because obviously she's still got to finish work. Yeah. And then she'd pick me up and obviously take me home. Some days when I was at college... I'd be in college from like nine till like 12 and then I'd have to get the train from Birmingham because I went to Solihull College um, down to London to Watford and uh, then obviously taxi there, train, do it all again, get the train back home and then sometimes I wouldn't be getting home till like about 10 o'clock. Yep, so to just redo it again the next day. Yeah. 
It's a lot of uh, you put into it, a lot of commitment from mm. y yourself and your parents. Yeah. Shout out to a lot of the parents out there because the amount of effort that they go to to yeah, make sure it, that their child. Hon honestly, like with my parents, I wouldn't be where I am without without what they do. Yeah. And I can imagine them sometimes thinking, "I wish you'd just give it up," <laughs> or because that that's also a pressure that some kids are face. That I don't think people realise is. Yes. They don't want to give it up because they've seen what their parents have had to do to get them to where they are. Yeah, and you feel slightly guilty. Um, but yeah, I, I, c I can't thank them enough. Yeah. Like being patient with me and going through the ups and the downs. Because they do, they go on the ups and the yeah, downs do, of yeah. your career with, with you. Every you. Part of the way, aren't they? Yeah, and my sister taking a massive backseat in terms of, because my football took a lot of priority. Oh, it's a nice little story, though, right? That, that's like a, a, a somber note. Look, we're going to get on to the goalie or no goalie quiz now oh. to lighten the mood again. Huge shout out to Forged Irish Stout for being part of this podcast. Listen to that beauty. An unbelievably smooth, creamy stout by Conor McGregor, the UFC legend. Not here to take part, but here to take over. Forged Irish Stout is on a mission to become the biggest Irish stout. Conor McGregor has taken over the whiskey game. Now he's about to take over the stout game. Me and my guests will be enjoying a few cans in the next few episodes. If you fancy checking it out too, make sure you hit the description below and find out where you can get Forged Irish Stout. Forged Irish Stout will be available in Asda nationwide come August. Let's get back to the podcast. Right, so uh, I've got five goalkeepers and five non-goalies. I need you yeah. to say goalie or no goalie. Yeah. Uh, so I've got five current uh, women international footballers oh, God. and uh, five other names from around the world. Uh, you can head over to YouTube to follow our leaderboard and it's one point for each correct answer. I'm going to get my little scoreboard here because it helps me count. Right. You ready? Yeah. Nervous? Yeah, because yeah, if I get do. it wrong, people This is say. a trick. Right, yeah. this is all a trick. Right. Number one, Victoria Essen. No goalie? She is a goalkeeper. She is Who's New fun? Zealand and Rangers goalkeeper. Oh, there she is. Heard of her? Now that you've shown me the picture, yeah. I've obviously seen a Joe, obviously, at like the World Cup yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Feel bad, sorry. Nah, that's sorry, right. Victoria. Right, number two, Dora Marquez. No goalkeeper. Dora the Explorer is not a goalkeeper. But no. <laughs> <laughs> See, who would have known her surname is Marquez, by the way? I know. If people listening to uh, this now one. are going to be like, oh, Baffled. I've always wondered that. <laughs> right, number three, Rita Sayachu. Mm, no goalkeeper. You're right. You're right. No goalkeeper. Rita Aura, real name. That's her Turkish surname by descent. That really threw me off, though, because of the, the last name. Yeah. Sayachu. Oh, I thought I pronounced that lovely as well. Oh, you're on two now. Excellent. Good start. Right, number four. Uh, number, yeah, number four. Almuth Schult. Goalkeeper. She is a goalkeeper. She is German goalkeeper that's currently a free agent. It's the last name that done it for me. Yeah. I actually used to like watching her play as well. Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, number five. Kaylin Swart. No goalkeeper. She is a goalkeeper. <sighs> she is the South Africa goalkeeper. She plays for JVW in the South African League. I'm not seeing her. No. But... She played in their last game against America, I think. She, they lost 3-0. When I was doing my research. I have to do all my research. <laughs> <laughs> right. Number six, Michelle Jones. No goalkeeper. She is not a goalkeeper. Do you know where you know that name from? No. I... MJ from Spider-Man, Zendaya. I've seen that you follow her on socials. I have to do a bit of research into yourself. I do like her. Yeah. Right, number seven, Jessica Cornish. Is that a goal goalkeeper? Jessie J is not a goalkeeper. I thought the last names. Mm, it's, the, it's the last name that yeah, throws you. Yeah, it's the last name that throws you. Yeah, yeah. You've definitely done your research. Yep. I do yep. follow her as and well. And you follow her, yeah, exactly that, right. Saw her live, great, great live. <laughs> really good, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, when she when she sings, you're like, how is that even possible? Because like, their mouth's not really moving, but like they depth. Yeah, I'm just like, 
Oh my god. Fair enough, right. Number eight, you're on four, by the way. Number eight, Adriana Franch. Goalkeeper. She is a goalkeeper. She is an America American. and Kansas City goalkeeper. Yeah. You want to roll now? Come on. All right. Number nine, Valentina Teroshkova. No goalkeeper. She is not a goalkeeper. She was the first woman in space. <laughs> that was confident as yeah. well. Right. And number 10, Christiane. It's Christiane Edler. Endler. I'll go goalkeeper. She is a goalkeeper. She's the Chile and Leon goalkeeper. Yeah. Seven out of ten. Got to be yeah. happy with that. Yeah, not bad. That's a good score, that. When really good score. We got the wrong one to start with. I was like, oh, this is going to be a long one. At least one. I didn't throw you off of Dora so, the Explorer. I, no, I do actually like watching her play as well. Yeah. Very tall goalkeeper. Yeah, she is tall, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was enough. like good. wishing I could. Wish I could be that tall. <laughs> right. Uh, I want to go on to representing England, England from a, a very young age and uh, well, working your, your way through the age groups. Must have been uh, an amazing achievement when you at first got called up. So, at the time, you actually got. Was it you were thirteen when you first got called up. Yeah, you used, get, you used to get sent a letter. Yeah. Um, you get sent a letter, and I actually thought, nah, this can't be right. Surely not. And I remember like they send you a list of everything that you need. So like obviously you take your boots, your gloves, your shin pads, but like, you f your sliders, your travel bag, and stuff like that. And I started thinking. I remember going with my parents to get everything. They got my new boots to go away as well, bless them. Nice. But it was it was so weird because there were so many girls there and obviously there's a couple that you go with from your team and then they like filter it down to then you're actually going away properly like for te like 10 days. I remember some of the camps was. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a long time. Yeah, it is, yeah. You think 10, week, 10 days on holiday, you're thinking that's, that's would have, great. Would that have been one of your first trips away, obviously, from your parents as well? For that long, yeah. yeah. Um, but I remember, like, you got players there um, from, like, Arsenal, Chelsea, like, really good players as well. And I was, like, my first one was I was, like, playing for Wolves. So it was just, honestly, like, I think my parents was more excited about it than me. Mine was more nerves because, like... You was very young as well. Yeah, was like you 13 called up to the 16s? 15s. 15s. Yeah, it would have been 15s. It might have been four, classed as 14s at the time just because of the, the age bracket. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I felt like such a like such a baby. Like some people like saying, oh, oh I'm, I'm like 14. There's nothing quite like when you first put on the kit though or the tracksuit, is there? That feeling. It is. It's like, and like, Everyone's watching you. You don't you don't realise like everyone is actually st staring at everything you do like when you're in public because you're all together in tracksuits. Yeah, and you you worked your way through pretty much all the way up to the twenty ones, didn't you? you yeah. So, so that I always think in my first couple of like age groups, I probably took that m for granted a lot more because you start getting picked consistently. Obviously. Yeah based off how you're playing and I was playing quite well the first couple of years and I remember as I was getting towards like the 19s I was at Arsenal at the time I just remember like getting picked and I was like how am I actually getting picked because I'm actually not playing that well but then I thought, thought you know what I'm getting picked I'm going to make the most of it of course yeah and some of the places I've been to some amazing places I've been to European Championships like qualifiers and stuff like that it's Amazing. You even captained England at one yeah. point as well. That was such a kind of surreal moment. I remember getting pulled by the goalkeeper coach. I was thinking, you know, when you get pulled by a coach, you think <laughs> Nervous. You, you start getting, you start sweating, you start shaking, like thinking back in your head, like, what have I actually done? I'm trying to think back. Have I, I did a play in the last game. Yeah, it's naturally what you think, don't you? Or what have I actually done? Have I, said, have I like, said something or have I done something? But I remember she sat me down and she went, I'm going to ask you a question now. She's like, how would you feel about being uh, captain tomorrow? And I went, I went, say that again? She's like, yeah, how would you feel about being captain tomorrow? And I was like, I I'd do it. Like, there was no hesitation when, obviously, when when it come, when it come about in that sense. Like, I'll do it. Like, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Like, you m may never obviously get to do it again. So, and I just remember, like, ringing my parents and telling them. And, like... My mum and dad started crying on the phone. I was like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, it's like, I think I was just more proud than yeah. 
than anything. And I remember it was at St. George's Park, and it was quite a long walk, so I had such a long time to be thinking, like, what kind of captain am I going to be today? But I tell you what, I had probably one of the best games of my life. Just to like the pressure then? Yeah. Yeah, the it was responsibility. Just, yeah, it, it was just something where, like, something just clicked and things, felt like, fell into place. Nice. And I remember I actually... I don't think he was meant to do this at the time, but I remember getting given at the end. Do you know when you like hand over the yeah like the, the commemorative flag? Yes, yeah, so obviously they obviously gave us the the who was it now? I think it was Switzerland. It was Switzerland that we played. Obviously they gave me that, and then obviously at the end you take it once you've done the handshake and everything. You take it to the the bench and they take it off you. And I remember they actually gave me my armband and the oh wow. Because obviously I'd had such a good game. Yeah. Said we don't usually do this, but the, the game that you've had and how you've performed, um, we, we'd like you to have it. That's amazing, yeah. I think that made my parents, yeah, yeah, like really like well up and yeah. really appreciate what I'd actually done. And for me, it was probably one of my another one of probably my best best days. Yeah, brilliant. Right, I want to do some uh, geeky goalkeeper stuff now. I want to talk about gloves and stuff. Right, so what gloves are you currently wearing? I currently wear Precision. There's some somewhere on there's. I have the, have tried those. Or the black and orange behind you. Um, I've also tried those, but I do have. Where are There's they? a few others. I do wear those. In the, <laughs> I wear those in the summer. There's a few up here. And then I draw. I sometimes wear majority of the time now wear the grey and green ones, which is like um, the grip on it has a little dotted palm. Yeah, like graphite or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're probably my, most of my time I'll be wearing those just because I feel like they're really like comfortable for me. Yep. Do you find that they're a bit harder wearing on the palm then? A little bit. Um, I just like the fit of the glove. The grip's really good and the the precision gloves like, like last for so long. Yep. And I can't speak highly enough of them. Like they're really good to me. The semi stuff whenever I need and literally I'll message them two days later. The box is at the training ground. Yep. They send out some equipment as well, don't they? Yes. Like Under Armours and socks and everything yeah, like that. Yeah, grip socks, Under Armours. Um, they sent me stuff for the girls as well. Like, she sent me like a rebound net. Um, Some training aids. Yeah, That's yeah. That's really good. Um, they do all the inflatable mannequins and stuff. Yeah. I'd rather run into one of them than, <laughs> yeah, than the plastic of... ones they set up for crossing. Yeah, yeah, the actual plastic mannequins. What size do you wear? I, I'm at, Technically, I'm a size seven and a half, but not many gloves do seven and a half. Yep. So I'll wear an eight. But some glove styles, depending on the style of the glove, I can get away with a seven. Okay, yeah. So it just depends on the fit or the cut of the glove. Yeah, so in those, these ones, I had to have an eight to try. Negative yeah. gloves are quite small. They do Whereas come up quite small. those ones, the white and the grey ones that I wear, yep. I can wear a seven. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Just because of the fit of the glove. Yep. Roll fingers generally do fit a bit baggier. Yeah, uh, and the negative are tight around um, the fingers, aren't they? Like the hybrid ones, I can get away with either size. But um, roll finger, I did wear for a bit uh, last season. But I find they cut into me a lot. Yep. So I, I've gone to the back to like the negative cut. Fair enough, right? Uh, and how do you look after your gloves? Wait, talk about uh, you're the first time you unbox a pair of gloves. Right? What, what's your? Do you have a routine? Uh, so luckily enough, with the ones that I have from Precision. I don't have to take the film off. Yeah. So annoying, so honestly. Annoying. And you, you're trying to pick it off, but not pick at the latex. <laughs> and people say, why does it take so long? I was like, I'm not telling you, you try taking it off because it's actually so hard to... And then like my OCD, I don't like anything sticking out of the plastic. Someone, either. I think someone tagged me in a hack for this, by the way, and you dip them in hot water. Really? And it's meant, someone in the comments, please mention this if you know how to do it properly. But yeah, yeah apparently if you dip them in hot water, the plastic just comes straight off. Mm, I might have to try that next time. Yeah. But yeah, like literally as soon as I get them, obviously I'll try, like I'll literally put them on, have a little feel and then I'll go and tap my hand like when my hands under the sink a little bit yeah and then like get rub, that initial chemical layer off yeah and then i like rub them a little bit and then i just leave them like hang them to dry yeah and then i'll i'll do that before i go out to try and if i've opened a new pair and then obviously i'll just wear them and then i'll wear them a couple of times in the week and then i'll actually do like this sounds silly but like a bulk wash of gloves people say not to do this but i actually wash mine in the washing machine do you wow right Oh, clear, ouch. clear <laughs> no, clear the clear the drawer of all the like the detergent, and I put the glove wash in with the gloves. Yeah, and then literally a bulk wash of gloves is done, and then I literally hang them to 
dry. Yeah? Yeah. Because that hurts that. Do you, what temperature do we put, wash these on? On like a really low. On a low, low yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the more the only in there for most half an hour. Yeah, quick wash. Fair enough. If that's if what it, works if for I've you. only used the one glove during the week, I'll wash them by hand. Yeah, because there's no point chucking. How, one... how often do you go through new gloves? Like you said, precision are pretty good to you, but are you are you three or four games? Are you just depending on how they last See, or like, the conditions? Obviously, pre-season you'll go probably through you do, a lot. Yeah. You go through a lot more. So leading into a game, I'll probably wear the gloves I'm going to wear for a match day the day before to see how they feel. Then that'll determine whether I wear them or not. Yep. Um, and then I'll have the gloves I've worn in the week in my glove bag for the weekend because I know that I've had... A broken in pair, yeah. just in case. Um, so I'd probably say every two months, I'll probably go through probably about two pairs of gloves. Is that all? Oh, yeah, it's not two, a, three pairs not of gloves. Yeah, so you're doing three it or four just, games. It just depends on... Conditions. Yeah. Yep. And if we've played on AstroTurf. Yes. It's because some teams we have in our league play on AstroTurf. Because generally, obviously, when the goalkeeper gets up, especially on an AstroTurf, the wear on the fingers where you get up and push. Yeah, but you... Or the outside of the... But you won't believe on some of the pitches as well because sometimes they put sand in the pitch. Yep. That destroys your latex and the gloves, yep. And the sa- obviously, people say, get up with your hand like this. But when you're trying to get off the floor as quickly as possible, I'm not thinking about my hand needs to be like this. No chance. You're just getting up as quickly as you can. Uh, have you got any uh, special preferences in different conditions? You know, like we're saying about the rain or... Uh, have you have you changed your gloves and worn really old gloves in a, ga- in a game before? Or I don't really change my gloves yeah. in game. I kind of like... So... I'll warm up in a pair and I'll have a feel of how I am in that session. But as I said, I always have a pair that I've worn in the week that are a bit more broken in. Yep. So then if I do ever, for whatever reason, the new the, the the newer pair rip or something, I've got a pair that's actually broken in and I've actually worn in the week to obviously have as a backup. Yep. Okay, right. Any uh, superstitions? I don't really have, like, superstitions. Like, I'd say you could probably call it one now, but... Obviously, I'll go out for the warm-up. You go out, obviously, before the rest of the team. You do a bit of shooting, and then I actually come in, like, five minutes earlier just because it's dead quiet. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm 15 minutes earlier. I like to just sit yeah, there, yeah, chill yeah, out, yeah. change so my like, kit. Ch- I, like, change all into my kit, and then I literally have just, like, five minutes of quiet before the chaos comes in, like, yep. the girls coming in, like, when, like, they're walking past you and stuff like that. Just have that moment of... Calm, um, reflection. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of goalkeepers are the same. Uh, all goalkeepers, well, a lot of the older goalkeepers now, especially. I know I do it, Fozzy did it. We would always go in 10, 15 minutes before the team and just go and sit and chill out because a goalkeeper's persona is one or two. It's like you're either a very calm goalkeeper or you're the hyped up uh, all-action hero type. Yeah. So like it's it's a hard one to gauge. I always find that young goalkeepers that I work with, they work too hard in a warm-up so that their adrenaline's through the roof yeah, yeah, yeah. and then they play in the game and by the end of the game, they crash. Yeah. So it's about finding that happy medium for yourself. Oh, another one. I do have a Red Bull as well. Yeah. So I'll have a little bit bef- before the warm-up, a little bit when I come in from the warm-up and then the last little bit at half-time. Yeah. Just stagger it across. Yeah. Good bit of caffeine in the system. Yeah. I- I've tried the caffeine gums. No, I, I just don't like Just don't like them. No. Don't oh. think they do anything. No, Every, everyone's yeah. got their own preferences. Uh, have you got any preferences on what you eat before a game? Are you, are you specific? Are you fussy? So, for me, like, I don't like eating loads before a game. I don't know how you feel when, you, when you play. Like, I don't like having that full feeling of when you're flinging your body around, especially in the warm-up, <laughs> of having that feeling of the food still being there. So, I'll always have, obviously, the especially at a home game, I'll have a bagel like toasted bagel with peanut butter, honey and like banana. Yeah, nice, yeah. Full of And energy. then like a, a yogurt as well with some like granola in and then probably a coffee or something and then that'll be me. Um, but yeah, I, d- I don't like to eat too big. I try and eat bigger before, like the day before because obviously I know I don't like to eat much the day of. Yeah. 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 Uh, and do, do you do much work on the opposition, like video analysis stuff? Do you do, you do much reflection on your own game after games? Um, I think for me, I'm, when you play in the league for a couple of years, you kind of get to know the players that you, you've played against yep. and you kind of know the trends. So you kind of know that aspect. But we always do footage on the opposition. So like 
how they press from the front in terms of how then we're going to look to play out, whether we hit full backs or, I don't know, like we invert the full backs and the centre halves drop outs, stuff like that. Um, but personally, like, I'll look at the game before and say, like, look at more, like, the goals that they've scored. and Chances how, created, the areas yeah. that they get shots from. And then, and obviously, the areas they look to target on their, on their set pieces. Yep. So, if, like, from corners, do they hit towards the back zone? Do they try and flood the six-yard box? Or yeah. do they aim for the front post? Yep. And then that'll mean I just adapt my positioning based off yep. that. Yeah, it just gives you a little bit of an insight into the yeah. opposition. But well, then it's always that thing you, where they might change it. 100%. Yeah. Uh, so what about penalties then? Do you look much into that? Obviously, you're saying you've got a very good record with penalties. So with the penalties, I'm quite fortunate enough that I have them on my water bottle. Yep. Oh, you do, yeah. Yeah. yeah we all, there's, there's a good cheat that goes around, doesn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll have the last, like, the last couple of penalty takers and their preferred side. But it's hard, obviously, at the start of the season because... There's not as much backstory on yeah, everyone. Yeah, so you have to kind of go into last season as well. So, yeah. yeah it was Martin Margaretson that started that. Uh, yeah. He's the England men's goalie coach. And obviously, yeah. we we all seen Jordan Pickford over the years. He's had it on his water bottle. Yeah. But I worked with Marge years and years ago at yeah. Cardiff. And he was the one that first brought it to my attention. Yeah. Like, yeah, just write on your water bottle. And then you know that number four hits it to your left. And, like, yeah. you know that. But then, like, you pick up traits when you're playing as 100%, well. Yeah. So, obviously, before, left-footed people are probably, like, say, you're completely wrong when I say this now. But a lot of the times when I've played against left-footed people, they tend to go to you right. Yep. Just because they don't usually like to cut across, cut across the ball as much. So, obviously, then when you see a left footer come up, you kind of have to, like, before this, before I started doing this, you kind of have to, like, use your, then your knowledge, like, okay, then they're going to open the hip up to then go to your right hand side so you can afford to like cheat a little bit and start go a bit earlier or yeah I think that sort of thing you kind of learn as well right and uh, finally right, I always finish on this question now but uh, I really like what because everyone says it's slightly different What what is the goalkeeper's union to you a slightly dysfunctional family <laughs> yeah nice yeah nice why it, you hate and love each other it's a it's weird it's a group inside a, gr a group and people ask about this and I say you actually can't understand it until you're in it in terms of you're actually a goalkeeper. And I think it's weird because you don't want people to make mistakes, but sometimes your chance could be off someone's mistake. And it's so weird because you're literally there rooting for the team to win, but someone's mistake can then give you your opportunity. Yep. But... I also like it that there's someone that there's people there that actually understand your situation that you're in. So in the good moments and the bad moments, because when you make a mistake as a goalkeeper, it's a very very lonely place. It really is, yeah. Yeah, you just want the, the stadium to basically eat you up. And, and no one else understands it apart from the goalkeepers. And you don't realise how much in your own head you can get. Mm. So then, like, I think over the years I've literally learnt to like, okay, it's happened. Like, there's nothing I can do now. The only thing I can do is make sure it doesn't happen again. Yep. And and the other goalkeepers then, do, do you have a good relationship with them? And Yeah, obviously I, I, they honestly, I have it. such respect for the people that I work with in terms of the goalkeepers. Because obviously, at the end of the day, like, it's not their decision who plays. It's, it's the, the managers. Manager, yeah. Like, obviously, you can influence in terms of, your your own like preparation and your commitment and how well you train how well you do your gym sessions and what you do outside of football but ultimately like there's a game plan the manager has a certain way of playing the opposition have a certain way of playing what goalkeeper is going to best suit that moving forward yeah oh brilliant well uh, thank you very much for coming in i've really enjoyed the episode no thanks for having me you enjoyed it yeah no i really really have the geeky side of goalkeeping yeah, yeah yeah something you don't always get to talk no about. exactly and obviously your journey i think it's very inspiring for, for girls out there uh that, that what you had to give up but obviously how well you, you adapted to different situations so full credit to you uh, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the season. No, thank you. This has been another great episode. Uh, I need to say a massive thank you to uh, our sponsors, Mito Red Light Therapy and uh, Forged Irish Stout. Uh, without them, the pod wouldn't be able to go ahead. Uh, this has been the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Please make sure you subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It really helps. Thanks, everyone. Bye.
What a save from Mark Howard.